Vítáme vás u dalšího dílu podcastu Insider. Moje jméno je Tomáš Jirsa, můj kolega a moderátor, spolumoderátor Michal Půr tady dneska není, takže mám po delší době svůj samostatný díl. Děkujeme našim partnerům, jako je advokátní kancelář Rowan Legal anebo společnosti Youngblock a děkujeme vám všem tisícovkám našich patronů na platformě patreon.com a gazetisto a doufáme, že nám dál budete poskytovat vaši podporu a hlavně váš feedback na každý díl. Máme za svou teďka hodně zajímavé díly. Do konce roku nás čeká ještě řada dílů. Budu prozrazovat, že máme v podstatě všechny prezidentské díly už taky připravené. Dneska máme takový zajímavý díl, který vzniknul hodně spontánně. Naším hostem je Matthew Gruen, což je britský publicista. Je to profesor politiky School of Politics and International Relations na univerzitě v Kentu. A naším Hlavním tématem rozhovoru bude dění ve Velké Británii za poslední měsíce, roky a nějaký výhled a dění, dění v Evropě. So, uh, welcome, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, how's your trip to Prague? It's, so far. it's been wonderful. Uh, I've realized that 20 years ago, I was living in the Czech Republic, uh, in Olomots, uh, where I was studying central uh, European politics and history. So 20 years later, I'm back and it's wonderful to be here. And still you have a, a trip left to do uh, tomorrow, if, if it's still valid to go to Olomouc? That is my plan, okay. <laughs> uh, to revisit uh, where I was in 2002. Obviously, just as the Czech Republic was preparing to uh, enter the European Union and beginning to go on its own journey uh, into Europe. Uh, and so here we are. Uh, Britain has left. Uh, okay. The Czech Republic <laughs> is, is still in, so we can talk about that. Okay, uh, for sure that will be one of one of the topics. Uh, just a, a, one of the curious uh, stories about about how this podcast actually came to uh, came to be. Uh, we met yesterday on on uh, on on its dinner uh, with uh, with Bruno Makaj and, and U.S. speakers, and I wasn't I, I met Bruno. Uh, half a year when he was here for his first book, and I wasn't sure who who, who you are and what's what's your background. It was a really interesting discussion at the table, and at one point uh, I I asked uh, Katka Vaisova from from Cevro, uh, who described me whole other thing, and I was I was quite sure that I a few years ago crossed your name and I wasn't really following it from then. And I was still thinking the, this whole day about, you know, how I remember you. And then I and then I found out I have this and this book that I managed to read parts of it uh, from, you know, a few years ago in my library, in my office, right, uh, right here. So it's uh, the National Populism, the Revolt Against Liberal Democracy, which you co-authored. And now Uh, you have this new book, which is which I haven't read, "Values, Voice, and Virtue: The New British Politics," uh, solely by you. Uh, and there is a chance uh, we'll be getting a Czech translation, maybe. Well, if you're interested in what on earth has happened to British politics over the last 20 years in terms of Brexit, Boris Johnson, and populism, and all of that stuff, this book will basically explain it to you. Okay, so. Can we maybe now get a, a brief entree? Uh, mm. what, what the hell is going on? Because Britain for the Czechs is always was uh, an inspirational country, a, a close ally inside the EU uh, with a bit of shared history and our anthropoid um, deployment uh, into into the during the Nazi Nazi era and you know all all of the participation of Czech soldiers in a, in the Royal Air Force and you know it's there's always a special connection and after brexit I think a lot of people lost track where the country is is heading and last month added up to I'd say general confusion so so what's going on 
<laughs> we'll start with a small question. Um, well, to put it in context, my daughter is uh, has just celebrated her first birthday, and I was uh, watching her play at her birthday party, but realizing that she's already seen three prime ministers, four home secretaries, five education five education secretaries, and two monarchs. So, for a one year old, she's doing remarkably well. I think essentially. What we're seeing um, playing out in British politics partly is the legacy of the vote for Brexit, which for the first time in British political history really um, underlined the fact that most of the people outside of Parliament wanted something that most of the people inside Parliament didn't really want to give them, which was an exit from the European Union. Ever since that moment, the ruling Conservative Party has essentially been struggling to react to that desire for change. And that desire for change was mainly about reclaiming national sovereignty, uh, lowering immigration, um, and leveling up the country, spending more money, more energy, more effort on areas outside of London. And for a while, it seemed like the Conservatives were going to respond well to that. We had Boris Johnson, of course, in 2019, who connected with that desire for change uh, and won the largest majority since Margaret Thatcher's final majority in 1987. But then it all came apart as essentially the Conservative Party came to the conclusion that it didn't really know what to do with all of these voters that it had won over, and it didn't really know what to say to those voters. And so where we are today is in the grip of a Conservative Party that, to be frank, doesn't really know what it is anymore, doesn't know what it wants to do, and has lost its sense of purpose. Um, and we can talk a lot about the detail of that and, and the different prime ministers and so on. But for me, at the core of this fundamentally is a story about a Conservative Party that is no longer really sure uh, about what it is and what it wants. Uh, would it be accurate to con consider that to be some kind of, uh, uh, how, how to put it, um, viewed from Prague, it was basically Brexit, depends on who is looking, but uh, seemed like a courageous move. You know, we are able to go on and um, alone, with some kind of relations with Europe, we are able to govern better, be again, some kind of a global power, uh, no restrictions um, from the European bureaucracy. And at this very point, and you said it, it looks like the, the governing force, the, the Tories kind of lost idea what what it is. Uh, we are sure we are exceptional and we can make it outside. And now it all came down to we, we're not really sure where this is all going, what is this about and and how to go on. Is, th is that like accurate observation? Essentially, yes. Uh, Brexit was a courageous decision. Uh, I should give you some context. I personally didn't vote for Brexit, but I was one of the few academics with a public platform who said after the referendum that we should respect the vote for Brexit and we should implement the vote for Brexit, which put me in about 10% <laughs> of the academic community and has made my life ever since that moment interesting, Honor. to say the least. Um, but I always thought that... Uh, for a large part of the country, Brexit made complete sense. Um, you know, for many British voters, they were looking at the European Union at that time. It, it it wasn't particularly successful. It wasn't particularly democratic. It wasn't particularly transparent and accountable. Uh, the North and the South were drifting apart. There was the refugee crisis. There were the atrocities in France, the Islamist terror. Uh, there was a general lack of leadership at the European level that was really unsure about where the future of the European Union uh, was going to lie. And for many British voters, you know, we have to remember that Britain, in the words of Churchill, was, was, was never really with Europe philosophically. The Brits never really embraced a sense of European identity. They never really developed a strong emotional connection to the idea 
of the European Union. So they were always half in and half out. And I think the migration issue alongside the sovereign debt crisis just brought all of that home to the Brits. And it, it, it reminded a large number of them that actually um, maybe there was an alternative future. There was an alternative scenario that they could explore uh, through Brexit. And, you know, initially, the Conservative Party responded well to that. You know, we have to ask ourselves a question here. Why is the British Conservative Party the most successful political party in the Western world? The answer is reinvention. The Conservative Party has always reinvented itself to meet the mood at the time. You think about Margaret Thatcher uh, coming out of the politics of the 1970s and the Cold War. Uh, you think about um, David Cameron repositioning the Conservatives to connect with new generations of voters. You think about then Boris Johnson in the aftermath of Brexit, reconnecting with working class Brexit voters, with people who haven't passed through the universities, who don't have university degrees, and with pensioners. And he puts together this unique electoral coalition, very distinctive, and it allows him to demolish Labour areas, left-wing areas of the country that had not been conservative, sometimes for 50 years and sometimes never before in history. And that was the 2019 election. And it showed that the Conservative Party temporarily had reinvented themselves to connect with this political realignment that has followed the Brexit referendum, much like the Republicans in the US have done much of the same sort of thing. What then happened essentially is that Boris Johnson showed that he was unsuitable for high office. He failed to get his arms around number 10 Downing Street. He failed to bring discipline to government. He presided over a series of parties during COVID-19, which alienated a lot of people. But more fundamentally, he didn't deliver what those voters wanted him to deliver. He liberalized the immigration system. So yes, freedom of movement came to an end, but migration from outside of Europe is now increasing dramatically. Um, the Czechs, the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Poles are no longer coming to the UK. The Indians, the Zimbabweans, the Nigerians, the Americans are now coming in much larger number. So the migration story has changed, and I don't think it's changed in a way that many Brexit voters were wanting it to change. And that big promise of levelling up the country, of doing more for regions that had been essentially left behind for 50 years, has never really evolved into a serious political strategy. So if you are working class, if you are on a low income, if you were working in steel and manufacturing, and now you find yourself working for Deliveroo or Uber, and you're thinking, you know, what? it's a different world, it's a different type of existence. Um, the Conservative government really didn't do all that much for those voters. And so where we are today is that they've essentially abandoned the party. They've essentially drifted into apathy, saying they're not going to vote at all at the next election. And we haven't really resolved one of the um, – we haven't really resolved the underlying drivers of Brexit, which is why, you know, I feel as though we've gone back to before the Brexit referendum, where we have lots of voters who are now unhappy with many of the same issues because our political class never really understood what Brexit was all about. And you could see that in the Liz Truss premiership and you could see it in the Boris Johnson premiership as well. They never really understood what Brexit was about. Um, it's astonishing for me because I, I happen to read and I, I, I don't, maybe you will know the, the guy who authored the book. Uh, it was like a former labor uh, MP who wrote about this dramatic shift caused by Brexit, saying that basically labor is lost forever, that the, the, the as you mentioned, that the Tories happened to uh, grasp these traditional labor voters with all these very, very important topics that uh, these labor voters uh that it um seemed they they stopped caring about it um and it's a year ago and now we have a year after that and basically the situation completely changed uh and turned around and is is this a how how is the the labor party going to tackle this because uh, if you have uh disaffected voters uh is there any chance they would be returning to labor 
So if you look at all of the voters in Britain who have abandoned the Conservative Party, about one in five have switched to the Labour Party, but most are now saying they're not sure who they're going to vote for. We have to remember that British politics is politics under a first-past-the-post electoral system. It makes it very difficult for any new party to break through, and it makes it very difficult for any populist outsider to break through. The only reason Nigel Farage, uh, who some of your listeners will know, was able to become a national political force, ironically, is because he used European Parliament elections to do that. So what that leaves us with is this Labour conservative duopoly, whereby the two parties essentially dominate the system. And it becomes very difficult to disrupt those two parties. So the Labour Party now is riding high in the polls. Uh, If there was an election tomorrow, the Labour Party would win a majority. It would almost certainly start to campaign for a closer relationship with the European Union. It would almost certainly start to set the stage for a second referendum on EU membership or indeed a third referendum. Some of your listeners will know the first referendum was in 1975 when Britain voted to join the European uh, community. Um, and, And we are, I think, coming to a realization, and this is important for listeners in the Czech Republic, I think, The politics of Brexit are not yet finished. The politics of Brexit are not yet complete. Uh, I think over the last 12 months, I've certainly moved from the view that there will not be another referendum in my lifetime to where I am today, where I'm now increasingly convinced that actually uh, we are going to head into another referendum at some point on our EU membership. Because Brexit has been so badly managed by the political class, including Brexiteers, because of the generational trends that underpin it, 76% of my students of Gen Z want to rejoin the European Union. 70% of their equivalents in Scotland want to leave the United Kingdom. The politics of of Brexit and the politics of the United Kingdom are now so underpinned by these big pressures that I just cannot see any way forward for the UK unless we actually have this big national debate about who we are and we go back into that ballot box and we uh, we battle it out again. Um, I think that will happen within the course of my lifetime for sure. Um, and it, it, I'm not pleased to say that. I personally think referendums are very disruptive, but it's been so badly managed that I think in, it, it is now become inevitable that we will end up going back there. And uh, the new figure in the game, Rishi Sunak, uh, what is your perspective on, on his chance to revive and and make a comeback uh, for the for the Tory party? Well, Rishi Sunak is a compelling politician. Uh, he's a former banker, former Goldman Sachs uh, trader or analyst. Uh, he is the richest prime minister, one of the richest prime ministers to ever occupy the position, not because of his own wealth, but because of his, his wife. Um, he's the first non-white prime minister in British history. He's a deeply vulnerable Prime Minister. He's not won a mandate from Conservative Party members. He's not won a mandate from Conservative Party voters or indeed any voter. He was appointed by Conservative MPs because of the disaster that was Liz Truss, who we may come to talk about. And Rishi Sunak has been tasked with essentially bringing the Conservative Party off life support, saving the Conservative Party. And he's proposing to do that by presiding over fiscal conservative politics, by increasing taxes, reducing spending, and trying to deal with this inflation energy price crisis. And he is putting all of his chips in the casino of British politics on the gamble that he can bring back a sense of economic credibility and competence to the Conservative Party. Because what I'm seeing, I'm a pollster, I I do polls every week. What I'm seeing in the polls is utterly remarkable. Uh, The Labour Party is seen as the most economically competent party in British politics. The Labour Party is more popular among Brexit voters than than the Conservative Party. To put that another way, the party that has campaigned for a second referendum to overturn Brexit is more popular among the people who voted for Brexit. I mean, this is a remarkable place for the uh, Conservative Party to be, and it underlines how badly they've managed this realignment. And so Rishi Sunak is going to try and get back in touch with that. It means he's going to campaign very hard on illegal migration across the English Channel. It means he's going to 
try and connect with voters who want less immigration, not more. And it means he's probably going to have to get brought into these debates about what we're teaching children in schools, about sex, gender, the cultural and, wars. and race. I don't call them cultural okay. wars. Uh, Why not? When, when, when we talk about women's rights and we talk about the welfare of children and when we talk about how we think about our history and our identity, if you use the language of culture wars, you are adopting language that, in my view, um, is very political and has been designed by activists to discredit those causes. So my particular appeal, mainly to conservatives, is to not use that language. Culture wars implies that this is a 5% issue. Women's rights and history and culture and uh, rights for children are, found, are foundational to civilization. So we shouldn't really use that kind of language. And I poll voters all the time, and large majorities of them want to talk about these issues and want to discuss what is being done uh, to uh, to our understanding of these issues. So um, Rishi Sunak, I think, will inevitably end up being brought into those debates, much like uh, the Republicans and the Democrats in the US. And I think we'll probably have to come up with a convincing answer to where he stands on those issues. Okay. And um, if you go back to the least understandable part of the whole story, which is the least trust. <laughs> no, uh, it's, a, it's the most easy part of the story to is, explain. Is yeah. Because, you know, it, when she came to power, um, the obvious reminiscence of the of the iron lady and you know all of this uh, was was playing out in a in in czech and european media so it was quite surprising to see quick demise of the whole thing liz liz truss introduced a brand of conservatism that belongs in 1986 and is not suitable for today's politics uh the you know put it this way The Brexit revolt was a revolt among working class voters primarily and voters who don't live in London, who have spent 30 years wanting an economy that is not built on financial services, on bankers and on London and the South East. Okay, that's a reality of the Brexit vote. That's a reality of post 2016 politics. The first thing Liz Trust does is introduce a policy to remove a cap on bankers' bonuses. Really? That's the first I didn't policy. Know that. That's the first major policy that comes out of the trust government. Wow. Okay. The second in the mini budget is to remove the uh, rate of tax on people who earn over £150,000 <laughs> a year. That's pretty suicidal. And the third is to begin to push to what I would call Davos on Thames, which is a political uh, model of, of the economy that is basically about putting London and the Southeast on steroids, which is exactly what voters did not want. And that is exactly why they voted for Brexit. So to me, Liz Truss or Trussonomics, as we called it, You look at the data, it's very clear on this. It's basically a 6% position. About 6% of British voters wanted to cut taxes, cut public spending, you know, let the market, you know, run riot. And that in turn helps us to make sense of why she suffered so quickly and so dramatically in the polls. I mean, Partygate was bad for the Conservative Party. Boris Johnson getting drunk in number 10 during COVID-19, like that was not a good look, right? That cost the party about six points. Liz Trust cost them about 12 points in the polls. Like it was a disaster. Um, because many British voters have been on that roller coaster before. They've been on that roller coaster with Thatcher. Now, look, whatever your personal views of Margaret Thatcher, I happen to think she was necessary for that particular moment in British politics. We needed to make the economy more fair, uh, more competitive, more productive, more dynamic. Um, but but her project came with massive costs, like there were huge costs with Thatcherism. And uh, Liz Truss kind of thought that she could go back to that model, let it loose, and that actually that would kind of drive growth and everybody would, would, would have no real issue with it and they'd go along with that. 
Well, I mean, what she forgot was like the first half of the Thatcher project. I mean, Margaret Thatcher didn't bring in tax cuts until the late 1980s after she'd got begun to get the country's finances under control. It was only in 86, 87 that Nigel Lawson began to do some of the things that Liz Truss tried to do in like week two of her premiership. So she was never really in touch with the country at all. And the Conservative Party essentially went to visit her and say, you know, it's over, the men in grey suits. Because the Conservative Party is historically one of the most ruthlessly efficient political parties. When the Conservatives sense, you know, they've got a vote loser, that person is, you know, the walking dead. I mean, they will get rid of that leader immediately. And so that's essentially what happened with Truss. And she, to me, I think the more that I reflect on the Truss period, I actually think in a way she was necessary for Britain because we can now finally see that Davos on Thames is not what most voters want. And we can finally see that reheated economic libertarianism is not where voters are. And this, again, I think has been a powerful reminder of what I keep coming back to, which is this profound disconnect between the new elite who are running Britain, uh, who are economically right wing, but culturally left wing. And most of the people who voted for Brexit who are often economically a little bit to the left and culturally much more to the right. Now, if the Conservatives had adapted to that formula, they could have been much more successful than they were and they refused to do so. Díky, že jste dokoukali až sem. Tohle bylo uh, zajímavé povědání s Matthew Goodwinem, který je jedním z uh, významných myslitelů dnešní Velké Británie autorem těchto knih National Populism and Values Voice and Virtue, která právě vyšla. V té zbylé části Insideru, která je za paywallem na Patreonu a gazetistu, jsme se bavili o celkové situaci v Evropě, o tom, jestli je nějaké světlo na konci tunelu a jak dopadne vlastně to srovnání mezi Británií, která odešla po Brexitu vlastně z Evropské unie a samotnou Evropskou unii, kde probíhají tenhle rok a určitě budou probíhat dramatické změny, tak jako byly v Itálii, všechno změnila válka na Ukrajině a postoj řady evropských zemí k ní. A jaká je šance, že jak Evropa a jednotlivé státy, tak Velká Británie najdou zajímavé lídry, kteří budou schopní tu současnou krizovou situaci, která na nás doléhá ze všech stran zvládnout a posunout nás všechny někam do lepších zítřků. Tak díky za vaši podporu a poslouchejte a snad vás to bude bavit. Díky.